could, you'll need a Bible to do that. Bible and seat back in front of you. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews today, far right and near the back. Uh, look for the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. I want to cover a little bit about what chapter 3 was about, so we kind of set the stage for where we're going. In chapter 3, what we learned was that uh, God has a house, uh, and, he, and He talks about that house, and He talks about being in that house, and He talks about that house being a place of rest, and He talks about how that house is not a temple made with hands, that, that God sits on His throne in heaven, and earth is His footstool, and yet that house is us, it's the people, uh, it's the people he dwell in. We related it uh, last week in Stuart to like this. If you were to ask me personally about my house, I could tell you about the physical property I live in right now in, in Hope Sound. Uh, but the truth is I've got a dozen houses that I've lived in. Uh, and so that really doesn't define me. What defines me is my wife and my two daughters. We are always the house. We are always a family. We are always the one I'm taking care of, pouring into, uh, concerned about. In the same way, God's house is his people. The people he's always pouring into, the people he cares about, that's his house. And, and so we begin this journey of going into chapter 4 uh, with one preface. If you look back into chapter 3, look at verse uh, 14 so we can kind of uh, identify our audience. Who is chapter 4? Who is this book of Hebrews being written to? And 3.14 says this, For we have become partakers of Christ. Uh, so what we know when we go into 4 is we're talking about those people who are in Christ. We're talking about believers. So the message he's about to roll out in 4 is to those who know Christ. And, and so we're going to take off. I'm going to read 4, uh, probably 1 through 11, then we'll come back and kind of dissect it. Therefore, let us fear uh, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, if any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard didn't profit them, because it wasn't united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed entered that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So he said somewhere concerning the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as he had said before, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. For Joshua had given them rest. I'm sorry, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also entered rest from his works as God does from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall away through falling away uh, from some example of disobedience. Uh, so here's the scene. Uh, we have a group of um, what we'll call Jewish believers, uh, Judaizers, who have all of their life studied the Old Testament and had the Torah, and that's been their guide in life, and they have known it speaks of a Messiah, and they've been waiting for that Messiah, and they've been doing all of those things that the law lined out for them to do. They've been doing their sacrifices. They've been giving the way it says to give. They've been, they've been doing those things that they know satisfy God through the law. And then this man, Jesus, comes on the scene. And Jesus has this message to give to them. And, and, and in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, he, he rolls it out like this. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. Now, that's not exactly the message that they're used to because the message they're used to is God has a plan, God has a pattern, we're supposed to be following this plan and pattern, we need to do these things, and then Jesus comes on the scene and he says, hey, you want to rest? I'll give you rest. And so the writer of Hebrews actually stops and goes back and says, guys, guess what? This is not a new message. This message that Jesus is rolling out of rest this isn't new to us. As a matter of fact, it's been there for quite a while. If you look just in the Torah, in the Old Testament writings, 232 times the message of rest is there. That there should be 
rest because I don't know if you're like me at all, uh, but there are times in my life where I feel no rest. I just feel like it goes on and on and on and there's never a break and we're always pushing and driving and going and, and we fight for things we call vacations and it takes you the first two or three days of your vacation just to unwind enough to enjoy the vacation and unfortunately you get about one day of unwinding and then the knots start rolling in your stomach because you're coming off of the vacation and know it's going to be over in a couple of days and you're winding back up to go back into the crowd and you never found that time of just rest. And so what this writer does is goes back and says, hey, there is a rest that we've heard about all along. Let me show you it in Scripture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip one through, uh, let's say one through three, and I'm going to come back to those in a minute. And I'm going to show you that in this Scripture, this writer actually points out five times of rest. Four of them historical, one is future. Four times to show them, hey, this message of rest has always been there. Maybe, maybe we haven't seen it. Maybe we need to look for it. Uh, and so we'll start in verse 4. For he, capital H God, has said somewhere concerning the seventh day. Now I don't know if that was done in humor or tongue in cheek, uh, but the writer says somewhere in the Bible, somewhere in the writing, somewhere in the scripture, it says that God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he says, they shall not enter my rest. Now, here's the reality. God creates the earth. And he spends six days fashioning everything that is involved in the earth. He's making a globe. He is filling it with plants. He's filling it with animals. And then on the sixth day, he creates man. And, and, and all of that is rolled out for us in the first couple chapters of Genesis. And then he does this odd thing. On the seventh day, he rests. Did God need a break? Was God tired? Did God say, man, that was a lot of plants and animals. I finally got that thing populated. It's all there, and I, got, I got, finally got a man put in there, so now it's time for me to take a break. No, God didn't need a rest. God doesn't need to take a break. God doesn't get tired from what he's doing. The point is he wanted to show man, and listen to me, man who was only 24 hours created. In the first day of Adam, it ended with the following day being a day of rest designated by God. And I think that's God giving this picture to man that, hey, rest is going to be significant. It's going to be an important part of your life. You're going to need that rest, so I'm going to prove it to you. The very first day I make you, the next day, we're just going to take a break. We're going to rest. And that cycle of six days of work and one day of rest goes all the way through. These people have known that. They have this thing called the Sabbath. And on that seventh day, they stop. And as a matter of fact, they got so uh, critiqued and so critical about that day of rest that they broke it into a group of laws to say, here's how you correctly observe the day of rest. If you carry something that is more than this weight, more than this distance, that's work, so that's wrong. Today, Today, if you go to Israel, and you go to a hotel in Israel, on the Sabbath, on Saturday there, you get into an elevator, it will only go one floor at a time. Only go one floor at a time, because they feel like if you go more than 12 steps up those stairs, or that elevator goes more than that distance, then you're working. And they're not supposed to be working. So that elevator stops at every floor. The doors open. The doors close. It goes to the next floor. It opens. It closes. So that no one works on the Sabbath. And so that was their mentality. And yet God is saying from the very beginning, that time of rest is important. Let's go to the next one. Five. And again in this passage, he says, they shall not enter my rest. Six. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them, failed to enter it because of their disobedience. Who are we talking about? We're talking about that group of Israelites, that Hebrew nation that got delivered out of Egypt, got brought across the desert, and it was time for them to go into the promised land. And they sent the spies over, who had known for literally thousands of years, but specifically 400 years, uh, that they were going to have this land, that God had promised them. So it is a land flowing with milk and honey. The things that they needed were provided for them there. It was a place of rest. It was a place made for them. And they bring their 12 spies there and they go check it out and they come back and two of them say, this is awesome. Let's take it. It's ours. And 10 of them say, dude, there's really tall people there. 
there's giants there. We, we shouldn't do this. And, and God is saying, no, 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 no. Remember what I did for you. I drowned your enemy in the sea, the one you walked across on dry land. I, I waylaid Egypt back there. I sent ten plagues. I struck down the firstborn of every family. I got this. And they said, no, we don't think you do, God. Those people are like over seven feet, so they're too tall for even you, God. And so God looked at him and said, wow, I, I've given you this rest, this land that was supposed to be yours and you won't take it. So through their disobedience, they didn't go into his rest. And if you look at three in the first part of four here, that's what he's saying, that because of their disobedience, because they didn't have faith in me, they never got to enter that rest. So let's go on and look at the next one. Now I'm going to skip seven and go to eight only for this reason, because it's chronological. I think it'll help us get the picture better. We'll come back to seven. So let's go on to eight. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Joshua, if Joshua would have given them rest, he would have never spoken of another day after that. Another day what? Another day of rest after that. In other words, what he's saying is if Joshua had stopped, if Joshua had said, we can't go into this land, we got to stop and just rest here, then there would have never been the other day of rest, the promised land, the gift to them, this nation, this land given to them. They would have never claimed that rest if Joshua had stopped. Now, okay, I, I get a little creative in my brain when I read Scripture, and I think about what was the situation really like at that time. And I don't know if you can imagine this, but we've been brought out of Egypt, and we decided not to go into the land. And so all of this generation dies. For 40 years, we're waiting because we know this is ours. We want it. We want to move toward it. And so we go over to the Jordan River, and just before it's time to go in, God takes Moses up on a mountain and says, you're not going to go in. Joshua's going to lead the people in. So for 40 years, we've been following this leader, Moses, okay? He's been the guy taking us to the promised land. We are the generation who believes this should be ours, and we understand that the whole other generation has died out, and now we're going to get to lay claim of it. And right before it's time to go get it, our leader dies. And this guy named Joshua takes over. Now, we know Joshua. That's not the issue. The issue might have been, though, that Joshua says, okay, here's how we're going to do it. I want everybody to take a horn. In your hand, we're going to go in and march around the city. And I'm thinking, they're all thinking, are you kidding me? We've been waiting 40 years. We've got to go attack this land. We've got to go take it over. And you want us to blow horns and walk around the city. Where's Moses? We need a leader to take us in and captivate this thing. And so the end up, what ends up happening is they go in and they march around that. And they watch God drop the walls of the city and say, take it. It's yours. So if Joshua had not led them in, if Joshua had said, let's rest now, let's not take this next step, then they would have never seen that conquering, that their obedience would have never led them to that place of rest. Let's go to the next one, because all of these are pictures of rest, but they're not the final rest. Now we go back to verse 7. Again, he fixes a certain day, and you'll see it in quotes in your Bible. Today. He's talking about our day, our time, as it exists right now. This is our day. He has fixed a day of rest, and it is today. Saying through David, after so long of a time, just as it had been said before, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. In the United States, we look at ourselves and we say, what is this time in history? Well, this is America. We started over 200 years ago. We had this guy named George Washington, who was our first leader and president. And so we identify with that. And in the same way, these people are saying, we are Israel. We live in this land that God gave us. And David was our great king. He was the guy that led us in and became the great. He built the city in Jerusalem. And, and so today is this time. Today is this time of rest and and. and, and we're in King David's time, and the writer is saying, and you know what? There's a rest today. God is our God. We now possess the land. There is a certain, but, but wait, that is not the ultimate rest. You, you may be comfortable today, but this is not where we're going. This is not the 
ultimate rest. And so to find that, you've got to read on. Now we go after Joshua and we go to 9. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people. So what he's saying is, historically, we looked at creation and the way God took a rest there. Uh, then we looked at uh, the entire Israelite nation and how they should have had a rest, but they were disobedient. And then we looked at Joshua, how he led them into the promised land and they were obedient and they end up getting this land. And now here we are today in the land that God promised us because we were obedient. But guess what? There remains another time of rest. There is still one coming. And this one has a title in verse 9. It, it says it is a Sabbath rest. What is a Sabbath rest? Because for most of us, Sabbath and rest are kind of supposed to be the same thing. But when you go back to the Greek and you look at the word, it is sabbatisma. Sabbatisma is the actual Greek word for Sabbath. And the definition of that word is the blessed rest from toils and troubles looked for in the age to come by the true worshipers of God and Christians. What are we talking about? What is the Sabbath rest? It is the rest in the age to come, that age where this world is gone away and now we're in heaven. So what he's saying is there have been these examples of rest all along the way. God has shown us the importance of rest. God has tried to lead us to a rest. But God is ultimately taking us to this thing called the Sabbath rest, where ultimately our obedience to Him will be fulfilled in the rest that we have there. So now let's go back to the beginning of one, uh, four one, and see how this plays out. Therefore, very first word, right? Four one. Therefore, anytime you see therefore, we need to find out what it's there for. So go back to verse three. Look at the very last scripture, of verse three. So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now what he's saying is the, the children of Israel ended up in the desert for 40 years and did not get to enter that rest that God had for them because they did not believe. They did not believe God could give it to them. They did not believe they were supposed to go in and take it. They became fearful. They backed up. They didn't believe and therefore they didn't get rest. So four starts with, therefore let us Fear. Now, you don't find this in Scripture very often where we're told to fear. I mean, fear is something we're supposed to not have, right? Don't fear. God is with you. Uh, be strong. Be courageous. And here he says, therefore, let us fear. And I'm going to give you the best uh, definition of fear. And I haven't asked my daughter for permission for this. So if I get in trouble, you guys back me up. 16-year-old. Let me, let me define for you a picture of fear. You put Brittany in a room with a bee, and you have fear. You have fear. You have her running in this run I never see anywhere except the fear run. It's kind of on the tippy toes. It's kind of run. And there's this sound coming out of her mouth, which is somewhere between a scream and help me and a bee, and all those words get mixed together. And I don't know what it is about our hands, but for some reason our hands play into fear because hers are going like this. And, and I think this is some kind of signal to a bee that I have wings and I'm bigger than you, okay? But she's running. And so there's this fear that he's talking about here. Therefore, let us fear. What are we supposed to fear? Because fear is not something I thought we were supposed to do. But look what he says. Therefore, let us fear while if, while a promise remains of entering rest, that any one of you may seem to have come short of that. For indeed, we have good news preached to us, just as they also, just as the people in the desert, that's who we were just talking about, just as they had good news preached to them that they were going to have rest. But the word they heard did not profit them because it wasn't united by faith in those who heard. So what he just said was, we should be afraid of not believing in God. We should be afraid of disobedience to God. Why? Because that's the thing that's going to prevent us from getting the rest that God has for us. The writer is saying, look, I want you to be adamant that you're going to believe. I want you to be adamant that you would walk the walk. I want you to be afraid of not doing it. I want you to work that thing out so that we can enter 
this rest. Because he says, you know, here was the problem for those people that didn't get the rest that God had for them. It didn't profit them because they didn't unite it with faith. I didn't put my faith into action. I'm going to open up a topic here, uh, and I want you to bear with me as we go through this because it, it can be a little sensitive, but I need you to hear me out and understand it. What God has just rolled out in these scriptures is God created the world. He did this work, and then he rested. And then he asked them to overcome their disobedience, to follow through with going into the land, to believe what he was asking them to do to get rest. And then Joshua had to lead them in, in a battle. They had to do this work to show that they believed in this God. They had to go into their enemy territory with horns and march around the city. Why? They were showing their belief. Uh, then today, we deal with obedience and faith. And it's become this topic in Christian faith which we struggle with. Why? Because we don't want to tie works, doing something, together with faith. It becomes a hot topic because now we want to know that works don't save you. But this scripture says that our faith should result in works. There should be some action that comes out of that faith. That when faith really becomes real and we enter into the rest that God has for it, it's because we're doing. We're marching forward. We're carrying the horns. We're willing to take that step forward. And so we look at scriptures. Uh, if you want to flip back to it, look at the book of James. It's the next book in the Bible. Hebrews, James. I'm going to be in chapter 2. I'm going to read you a section of chapter 2 that's always been very controversial, but I want to try to lay it out there in light of what this writer of Hebrews is saying so we can grab hold of how we're supposed to think about this. Uh, James, to me, is a very, very practical man. He is the guy that says, okay, let's just call it like it is, a spade a spade, and understand this concept. And so in James chapter 2, starting in 14, he says this, What use is it, my brethren? If someone says that he has faith, but he has no works, is that a faith that can save him? If a brother or a sister is without clothing or in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, and yet you do not what? Give them what is necessary for their body, then what use is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Now, what is James actually saying? That we must do works? Because if we must do works, then we're trying to earn God's favor by doing works, and he's saying, no, it's about what Christ did, not what you do. That is not what James is saying. What James is saying is, you're telling me you have faith, but I don't see it. I don't see you doing anything in your life for God. I don't see any giving to the poor. I don't see anything that would be an indication that you actually have this faith. So what good is your faith because it doesn't produce any kind of works that we can see to validate your faith? Their faith, their works was not earning God. What he was saying is when you have faith in God, it results in an obedience. It results in a following. It results in giving to the needy. It results in being a person of grace and mercy. You show those tangible things because you have faith. 18. But someone may, may, uh, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Now show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one and you do well and so do the demons. They believe in shudder. Uh, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Again, what he's saying is, you want to see that I actually have faith in God? You want to see that I actually believe in God? Watch me. Check out what I do. Do you see that I'm willing to go in and fight the giants? Do you see that I'm willing to step forward in faith in my finances. So what James is actually saying is, can we just get real on this subject? You guys are talking faith and I'm not seeing it. James is saying, how are you going to convince me that you actually believe in God if you're not willing to go in to the land? If you're not willing to walk forward in obedience? So it is obedience 
that shows our faith. And so what James's bottom line question is, do you really have faith? Are you just saying it because I'm not seeing you walking it? And I think James's ultimate concern was, do you have this relationship with Jesus Christ? Because if you do, it will result in obedience. It will result in, in you moving forward in those things. In other words, salvation for you and I is not a hand stamp. It's not, I got it, I'm good, it doesn't matter what I do, how I act, let's go. My question to you is, do you really have it? If your mentality is, y'all are never going to see it, but I got it. And I think that's what James is saying. You want to tell me you have faith? Show me you have faith. Don't tell me you have faith. Let's see it in what you do. Now let's go back and look at Hebrews 4.10. Hebrews 4.10 plays out like this. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now what were we just talking about? What rest were we talking about in verse 9? We were talking about the Sabbath rest, that final rest, that heaven. Now look at what he says about that rest. For the one who has entered that rest, his rest, God's rest, that Sabbath rest, that heaven rest, has himself also rested from what? His works. And then look what he does to, to, to help us grab this picture. Just as God did from his. So what he's saying is, God has been working. God has been creating. God has been delivering his people. God has been doing these things. And then God takes a rest and he's telling you, I want you to walk in obedience. I want you to walk out your faith. And by the way, there will become a day when you put that down and you rest. And it's that Sabbath rest in heaven. It's that ultimate rest. All of these things that have gone on are a picture of this ultimate rest that I'm going to give you. And in that day, you'll be able to put down all of this having to go in to do the battle, all of this having to follow the law, all of this making sure that you are right with God and your sacrifice. I'm going to let you put all of that down and you're going to enter this heavenly rest. 11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall uh, through following the same example of disobedience. So what he's saying is, don't miss the example that he's giving you. Don't miss this picture. These guys left Egypt. They went through the desert. They were supposed to go in, but they didn't have obedience, and so they didn't get to go into that promised land. Let's not let that be said of us, is what he's saying. Can we be diligent can we be diligent about walking out our faith? Can we be diligent about not just talking about our faith, but people being able to see our faith, things actually happening, us being obedient to God, us doing those things? Now, let me make it real clear. Doing things for God does not result in your salvation. Your salvation results in doing things for God. Do you see how that works together? I cannot earn God's favor by doing nice things and great things. I cannot get God to love me because I'm doing obedient things. All of those things are being done for the wrong reason. Because at some point, God says, when you were yet in sin, I loved you and I sent Christ to die for you. When you weren't doing those things. And so God is saying, I love you, I am going to take care of you, I'm going to send my son to die for you, whether or not you're doing works. But guess what? When you enter into that relationship with Christ, that first picture of rest comes to your mind. I now see I've entered into a relationship with Christ, I get my first picture of rest. How is that? Philippians 4, 7. I get a peace that passes understanding. I'm still in the same storm that I've been in. My life is still chaos. There are problems. I have financial issues. i got relationship issues. They're all a mess, but then Jesus steps in and I have a peace that it's all going to work out. I have my first view of rest. Wow. I now have the creator of the universe getting involved to fix these things. I believe him. He said he would take care of me. I'm going to walk in that belief. I'm going to be obedient to that belief. I'm going to go ahead and say, you will take care of me, God. Therefore, I'm not going to stress about this. I'm going to walk in obedience. I'm going to walk uprightly. I'm going to 
follow righteously and watch you bless. And if there's any confusion on the topic at all, we're going to go back to Ephesians 2.8 that says, For by grace... God's unmerited favor toward you, God's love to you, God's desire to pour himself out on us for whatever reason, by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. Now, I've been saved through my belief in him. I get saved through my faith, and it's not of myself. It's a gift of God. It's not the results of work so that no one can boast. There's no way I can tell anybody I'm going to heaven because I help some poor people. I'm going to heaven because I go to church on a regular basis. I'm going to heaven because I pray in front of people. I'm doing some great things. And so, No. My only shot at going to heaven is God's grace. God's saying, I love you enough that while you were yet sinner, I sent my son to die for you. Why? Why did God have to send his son to die for me? Because even in my righteous works, which scripture tells us are dirty rags to God, even in, my right, even in my trying to earn God's favor, God said, you're being disobedient. If I'm trying to earn God's love with my works, I'm being disobedient because my good works are a result of my faith in him. By grace, you've been saved through faith. God decided that we're disobedient when we do something different than what he's asked us to do. And you guys will hear me say this over and over and over until we all got it. This book was never laid out and kept for us to give you a set of do's and don'ts. It was never meant to hold you captive. It was never meant to say you have to live this way and you have to show everybody you're a Christian and you can't do these things that seem to have pleasure and you must do these things that you don't really like. It was never meant to be written for that. It was left for us to say this will bring you peace. And let me explain this if you haven't seen it in your own life. When you begin making the decisions that fall in line with this book, you get peace. You get rest. So when I make a decision, uh, I'll just pick one thing, if I make a decision to go outside of the bounds of marriage and, and have sexual relations with someone, and, and that brings about a child when I'm not ready, and, and, and all of a sudden I've got all of this chaos going around about what happened, I've got no peace because the whole thing got messed up. Why? Because I went outside of God's direction. And God said, you know what? If you'll wait and marry that person that I'm lining you up with and you have a child, it's all going to be great. Even in the middle of the night at 2.30 in the morning when you're feeding that screaming kid, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be restful. You'll enjoy it. I set this whole thing up so that you could understand what real peace and real rest is by being obedient. But we didn't. We chose to be disobedient. We chose to kind of do it our way. And God said that's sin. And that sin will have to have consequences parents in the room you understand consequences it's when your kid does something wrong you don't let it slide you don't let it go you have to address it why because if you tell your child not to run out in the street and they run out in the street and you don't give them a consequence you're telling them it's okay to run out in the street we don't do that we give them some kind of stern consequence to say never ever 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 do that because it can lead to your destruction and in the same way god is saying i'm trying to give you that guideline for your good, for your safety. And we chose to run out in the street. So God says, you'll have to have the consequence. And the consequence is, I'm going to have to be separated from you eternally. Can't live with you because you're disobedient. Uh, yes, you're going to be separated eternally in a place called hell because you're disobedient. Well, well what do I do? Because I've already been disobedient. I've already run out in the street. Uh, I've already done wrong. And God said, you know what? While you were yet a sinner... I sent Christ to die for you. What was the purpose of that? Because a punishment needed to be paid. A consequence had to happen. I deserve that consequence. I deserve that death. I deserve that beating. I deserved what Christ got on the cross as my punishment, and Christ took it for me. How could he do that? He could take it for me because he came to this earth, and he walked, and he lived it out, and he didn't sin. In other words, when the end of his life came, he was ready to go directly to heaven because he hadn't sinned. And yet all the rest of us did sin, and God said, you can't go to heaven. And so Jesus, being the only one who lived it in a way that there was no consequence, there was no punishment, said, I'll take their punishment 
so they can have my standing. I'll be the one who gets punished. I'll be the one who knew no sin, and I'll become sin so that they might become righteous. They get my standing with you, God. I get their standing. I get punished. They get righteousness. That's the gospel. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. Here it is in a nutshell. He paid the penalty that we deserve for going against God's word. That's what he did for us so that there is no punishment or consequence due us because we are now seen in God's eyes as he sees his own son. You did it right. Jesus took the punishment for you. There's nothing to punish you for. Therefore, come in. Come into heaven. That's the gospel. That's what he's offering you today. Do you believe that? Are you willing to enter into that rest, that place where Christ becomes the source of your peace and your rest because the creator of the universe sent his son to take your place so that you could have the peace and rest of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for just a minute. Not as a trick, not as a game, but as a straight out, get alone and, and talk to yourself about this. Say, do I believe that Jesus Christ took the punishment for me? And that once that punishment was paid, he was able to return to heaven and sit at the right hand of God now and wait for us to come to heaven. Do I believe he did that for me? Because God says, that's the obedience step I'm looking for that gets you into rest. I'm looking for you to believe that, to put your faith in it, to trust in it, to know that when you accept that free gift of Jesus taking the punishment for you, that God's going to rush into you and God's going to lift you up and give you peace and give you rest. Does that mean the storms will go away? No, but you will have a peace in that storm because you'll know the creator of the universe is working in your favor. You'll know the creator of the universe got your back. So the question comes to you today, do I believe Jesus died, paid the punishment for me so that I could have his right standing with God and spend an eternity with God. If you don't know that, 1 John 3, 15, these things were written in the book of life so that you could know you have eternal life. What was written in there? That Jesus died for you. That Jesus took your place and was punished in your place so that you could have his righteousness. How do you grab hold of that? Maybe right now, right here in this moment. Uh, you know, Scripture doesn't say you have to walk down to the front of a church and shake a pastor's hand. I, I never see in Scripture where it says you have to take a series of classes to accept this grace that God's given you, to accept that salvation. What Scripture says is you have to believe in what Jesus did for you. So maybe in the stillness of this moment right now, you could have a conversation with God. And maybe that conversation would go something like this. I get it. I understand, God. I've sinned. I've done the stuff you told me not to do. And because of that sin, God, you're going to be separating from me eternally as the consequence for my sin. And yet, God, your scripture says that you loved me so much that even when I was in that sin, you sent Jesus to pay the punishment for it. So today, God, I believe that. I'm going to put my faith and trust in Jesus to have taken care of that for me. Your scripture says that you'll send your Holy Spirit to begin guiding me and teaching me and helping me understand you, and that's what I want, God. I want to see my faith walked out for real. I want to know that I'm doing these things like coming to church and praying and all that because I believe and I have faith and they're the result of that relationship with you instead of trying to gain your favor by them. So I'm just going to accept it this morning, God, that you love me so much that you would send Jesus to die for me and you would give me a new life starting today, starting right here, right now, when I put my belief and faith in Jesus. And I look forward, God, to just walking this out with you, watching you change me from the inside out. Thank you, God, 
for explaining it to me today. Thank you, God, that I can understand it, accept it, and become a child of yours forever. Thank you for that forgiveness, God.